Thank you very much for the introduction. Dobrodan, dobrodošli, but here my Slovenian is ending. Beg your pardon, uh, so far it's very nice that you're accepting that uh, I can speak uh, English here. It's a challenging theme, when does uh, the European Union end? I think uh, the advice I got was uh, even uh, uh, giving an additional remark uh, when the, is the enlargement of the European Union the end uh, of the European Union? Under a special context, obviously uh, seen here. First of all, I think I may answer the whole question uh, immediately. I will say no. But uh, that's not the reason that I am now ending and going out and saying job done. Uh, I will give you some arguments concerning the current situation of the European uh, Union. First of all, uh, I am one who is really convinced that the Peace Nobel Prize for the European Union uh, is justified, and I may tell you why. I think, don't forget that for three centuries, for example, the tensions between the French and the German uh, were the real situation in the center of Europe. Uh, maybe, gone, problem solved, it's a better understanding. Don't forget that the downfall of the Soviet Empire and the communism is a tremendous change for Europe. Uh, if uh, big empires are falling down, you will always get a lot of wars. You can see it, and uh, you as Slovenian know it even better, the downfall of Yugoslavia created wars, uh, therefore. And I think it is a big advantage because for the countries coming out of this Varsha Pact system, the perspective was to join the European Union. It was a effect of stabilization uh, existing here. So far, it's justified. Third, it's justified also to be a challenge for the European Union because, and here I'm coming closer to the theme, uh, are we able to do this job? Uh, are we really learning on this? The big difference between the time of the division of the continent, uh, West and East, I think is that there was a pressure on the Western side uh, to act together. I think this was a very important factor of integration. I think uh, in confrontation with the Soviet system, with the challenge here existing, to come closer and to come uh, together. It's a learning process. And it is by all the difficulties and by all the crises uh, you can read every day in the newspapers and you will see in the TV stations, I think it is a learning process. Uh, I grew up with this uh, famous sentence uh, of a, an Austrian writer, of a, a writer from Kurushko, uh, Ingeba Bachmann. Uh, she said, uh, <coughs> history teaches us a lot, but she, uh, history does not find disciples. I think here I may say, history has found some disciples on this subject, because these are the changes uh, of Europe uh, of uh, great importance. So I'm coming closer to the question of enlargement. It was logical after uh, the end of the division uh, within Europe, I think, to enlarge the European Union. And they followed two principles uh, by enlarging. There were uh, first enlargement steps after the first six. Uh, Great Britain, Denmark, and Ireland came, came in, and uh, the next step uh, uh, was uh, for sure uh, the Austrians, uh, the uh, Finns, and the Sweden, and so on and so on. The other principle, doing enlarging the European Union and deepening the European Union. Deepening means more responsibility, not only the common institutions, uh, but more responsibility for whole Europe. The last enlargement, the so-called Eastern enlargement, failed to do so. I think they did enlargement, but they did no deepening. The result of this request of deepening was a convent for a European constitution, but this failed. Maybe it was too ambitious, because one thing was miscalculated. For such a huge process, you need time. You need time to learn on the subject. I'm always uh, telling a, a primitive example. Okay, we have criticism uh, on the judicial uh, situation in some countries, and so on and so on. You can kick out the Minister of Justice from one day of the, of the other. No problem. We will get a new one. We will always get the Minister. But to kick out the judges and to, to bring on you, therefore you need some. 
are the existing, are the educated, and so on and so on. And so far, I think it lasts a lot of time. But on the other side, and that's the other problem, uh, the world in the moment is in a hurry. The changes are tremendous. I may tell you, uh, I'm born in 1941. I grew up in the post-war Austria, in this post-war situation, and what is happening since my youth time until now, and even in these days, is tremendous impressive how quick the changes are. The circles of changes are even quicker and quicker from one day to the other, and that's a big challenge, in fact. So, what about the enlargement? Uh, I think the former enlargement, where Austria was, for example, a part of, or others, uh, or Sweden, and so, were comparatively easy. What we had to do is to learn not only the principles of the European Union, but also the rules already decided, and to overtake them. For the countries coming out of another political system, and this was the part of the Eastern enlargement for sure, uh, they had to learn the rules of the European Union, okay. They had to recover from their past in another political system, and they had to join a world under tremendous changes at the same time. And this is a little bit too much to do it uh, within one moment or to do it in a short time. And by this, we are suffering. May I say it in a very primitive language? In the moment, we are relearning Europe. We are relearning Europe. Because uh, I'm running around uh, through whole Europe and giving speeches and discussions and so on and so on. My experience is uh, that the common citizens of Europe uh, has a limited l uh, knowledge about Europe. I give you some primitive examples. Sometimes, I have to apologize to you, uh, but even state names are mixed up. Slovenia, Slovakia, sometimes also Slavonia is done in. Uh, that's really happening. Or geographical distances. I'm sometimes telling my Austrian fellow citizens, uh, how far is it from Vienna to Prague or Salzburg? What is nearer? Every Austrian will answer you, Salzburg is quite clear, uh, it's so close. Prague is nearer. I think we have to relearn geography in a certain way, because geography is not only a question of a map, it's also a question of feelings, of a certain closeness here existing. I even have a more horrible example, the distance from Vienna to the Swiss border, pretty well known in Austria. I'm always saying that's the same distance as from Vienna to Uskorod. And everybody's saying, Uskorod, where is Uskorod? Huh? If you are telling them it's the first bigger city in the Ukraine, everybody was looking, oh, oh, never heard it, but uh, Ukraine is so close to Vienna. Here you can see what I mean. That's a great challenge. Geography is even primitive because you have maps, you have GPS, and so on and so on. I think the question of closeness uh, between the different states, or let me say between the different peoples, is even more challenging. I think to know what is in common. We first of all know what is different from the others. Uh, that's one of the things which are immediately coming up. We are different from our neighbors and so on and so on. The real question for us Europeans is what is in common? And so far, and out of the box, what we are doing, one of the challenges I'm asking you is, I think, to consider what is the content of Europe? What is the content of Europe? Seen from my point of view, the best uh, president of the European Commission in the past was Jean-Jacques Delors, a French who was it 10 years. We owe him, uh, I think, the free market. Uh, we owe him Schengen, and we owe him the preparation for the euro. He was one who was, was really preparing the ground for, uh, for changes. He said the marvelous sentence which I love. He said, you cannot love a common market. He is right, it's not sexy. It's necessary, but it's not sexy. That's not an emotional argument. But you say you are feeling emotional by a common market, me not. I think I'm interested, I think, to, to make trade, to have economic connections, and so on and so on. Second part of this sentence was, we have to give Europe a soul. 
I'm asking you to understand so, not in a Christian's uh, way or as animistic or, or whatever. I think so means in this context, content. Content. What keeps Europe together? We have some uh, famous sentences always said, unity in diversity. That's very nice, but to do it is not so easy. That's even if you are living in Austria in a smaller country. We have some diversity in my home country, and living together is sometimes a problem, mutual understanding. And I think if you're doing it in a bigger way like uh, Europe is, you have to learn it, uh, how it really is and how you are you really together. And we are in midst of this learning process. Even if I would go further on, we are partly in a learning process that even in the European member states itself, they have problems. Look to Spain, concerning Catalonia and the Basques. Look to Great Britain. What about the Scots? I think they are tra trying to separate and so on and so on. Look to Belgium, existing since 1830, it's quite a time. Now they are discussing division between the Flemish and the Wallons uh, and so on and so on. We have to learn to live together in diversity because first of all you have to know the diversity and to know what is in common, what is really connecting. And for sure here I may say, a lot of things are really connecting. Uh, I'm always asking, first of all, to look to arts. Here is more in common than you ever know. I give you some examples. Uh, you know, Franz Liszt, as we are saying, the Hungarians are saying Liszt Ferenc. I think a very important composer, if you're listening to music, uh, folks music uh, from uh, the Hungarians is coming in, you have the feeling for the pushta here at the Hungarian Rhapsody and so on and so on. What is in common? First of all, he was born in Austria in a tiny village at the eastern border. It was part of the Kingdom of Hungary uh, before, I think by the changes of the First World War it was changed. Liszt Ferenc was never able to speak Hungarian language. He learned it four times, he didn't succeed. And at the end of his life, he was living on the side of Richard Wagner because his daughter married uh, Richard Wagner. Uh, I think for sure a very German place. Huh? But Liszt Ferenc is for sure a very important Hungarian composer. Or another way, Bedrich Smetana, writing Marast, four important compositions on Bohemia, Czech Republic and so on and so on. Bedrich Smetana spoke a nasty Czech. He was uh, uh, speaking German. Uh, I'm telling you the story not in favor of uh, German language. Uh, so there are f quite more connections existing as we really know. But you can go even back to uh, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. Seduction uh, from the Sarail, famous opera. I think it's even touching the world of the Ottoman Empire, of the Turkish and the Arab world. And they have in the Turkish march as a music and so on and so on. Connections by music musics are, are extremely big. Uh, I think he, here I can continue and can tell you the connections between Slovenia and Austria on this subject, uh, even also the science. If I'm passing by the Technical University of Vienna, we have statues uh, of uh, famous uh, scientists there. 50% of them are Slovenian. Huh? If you ask a Viennese, uh, Mr. Kaplan, who was Mr. Kaplan? They do not know that it is Slovenian. Uh, I think here you can see the connections. We are supporting each other. We are learning from each other. And for sure, if you are here at the university, you have to know, I think the universities shall be and should be uh, a symbol of these connections. The universities we are founding as a channel of idea in the outgoing Middle Ages and in the Renaissance. I'm always admiring this time. Why? Because the professors and the students in this time were moving from one place to the other. They were moving from Krakow to Heidelberg or they were uh, moving from Paris to Palermo and so on and so on. If you are looking to the uh, life stories of outstanding professors, uh, they were traveling a lot, and the airplane was not yet invented. I think it was not a, even a problem. And the students were moving. They had one advantage. They had a common language, Latin. And they had the same canon of teaching here, faculties and so on and so on, which differs from today, but we are living also in another world. 
I was Minister of Science, I may tell you, to move a professor from Vienna uh, to Graz is a horrible problem now, by legislation and so on and so on. I think in this time, they were more flexible, they were more mobile. So far, I think one of the advantages are programs like Erasmus, Socrates, Leonardo, and so on and so on within the European Union, creating a little bit of this, what is in common here, uh, in favor of the European Union. You might say, okay, he's speaking what is positive and what are the positive results, and I can do it for sure endless. What are the difficulties? The difficulties I've already mentioned. The world is moving extremely fast. The challenges are even more and the reactions of the politicians are even slower and slower. I was a politician, so I dare uh, to say so. What is the problem here? You might tell you, yeah, we have an economic crisis, we have a banking crisis, we have a euro crisis, we have a financial crisis, and so on and so on. May I give you the interpretation that I am in favor of crisis? If you're uh, looking from where the world, cr world crisis is coming, it's coming from the old Greek language, krino is the basic word, and if you're looking for translation, uh, it means to judge and to decide. I think an era of a crisis is a challenge to judge the situation and to decide. So far, I think we have the chance at the moment to preform another way of Europe by the content of Europe, as a soul of Europe, and, and this I want to add, that's a big challenge for your generation, I think the relation of Europe to other parts of the world. I think that you have to face with the fact that Europe is losing importance. For a very long time, uh, by science and uh, research, also for sure by politics and power, uh, Europe was dominating. I think now we have other superpowers, you can say uh, United States, it's uh, quite close to Europe and uh, the roots are there for sure, but it is another part of the world. And China is coming up and India is coming up and uh, Latin America might come up and nobody knows how things will move in Africa. We have to define our place in the world uh, as Europeans, what we are contributing. I'm inviting you to use in one expression which I like very much. We are living in a global village. I think by all what we have, uh, by all our techni technicals which we are using, by all the, uh, these horrible instruments like handies, uh, internet and so on and so on, we are coming closer. And I think if something is happening, elections in Japan recently, I think the index, uh, the stock exchange is moving up, then there are some other things happening, uh, it's immediately going down worldwide. So we are depending on each other and we have to learn this. And another challenge here in this context is information. Uh, you will have a, a speech about democracy. It's up to the speaker to touch it. But I'm asking you uh, to, to know the following. Ar Aristotle made a very nice remark on democracy. Uh, he was saying, if the democracy in the time in Athens, uh, the democracy, uh, democracy reaches so far as the voice of its herald is heard. Keep this in mind. I think we are depending in democracy on mutual information, that we are able to hear, that we are able to speak, and uh, that we, are, we will be hear, heard, and so on and so on. It was comparatively easy on the marketplace of uh, Athens uh, in a limited number of audience. Now we have an audience uh, for the bigger part of the continent, you have to look at the fact democracy is still not yet in the majority within the European Union, but the number starting from my lifetime as I was young until now uh, is tremendously increased. One of the big changes of Europe is we have more democracies. And so far we have to learn how this democracy, it's not only the democracy for my village, for my town, for my region, for my country and so on and so on, it's a question, are we able to do it and uh, to have the respect for the human rights uh, and the possibility to influence this as, as a citizen? And this is based on information. So for the medias are playing an important role with tremendous changes of the medias. 
I think forget the importance of printed medias that's going down. Uh, they are closing uh, less importance or are very much influenced uh, by economic power, advertisement, and so on and so on. Public broadcasting existing, but also under difficulties. Private television is for sure coming up. And the social media are the most important part, not yet very social, because it's a relation from you to me. Uh, how to create a society out of this relation is not yet done, but I'm quite sure uh, it will really work out. At a certain moment, I was fed up uh, about talk shows. I don't know exactly the Slovenian TV, but uh, I think in a lot of other European channels, we have talk shows. Uh, every evening, boring sometimes, always the same people saying the same nonsense, a lot of hot air, and so on and so on. There is no European talk shows. Talk show. There's only the Iron News, which is a kind of uh, official press agency of the European Union. I was going to the European Broadcasting Union. Uh, this is uh, the union of the public broadcasters uh, here and was asking, why are you not doing a European talk show? Please don't tell me it's a language problem because a simultaneous translation is already invented. You can do it uh, in shortest time possible. I got a very nice answer which I will never forget. Uh, if we are doing so, we had to divide advertisement between the different companies and nobody is eager to do it. It might be losses or, or whatever. So I'm always saying, and don't laugh too much about, we have only one European talk show, you know. It's the Aerosong Contest. Why is it the Aerosong Contest? Because they are, we are voting. And by this voting, you can learn a lot of politics. Who is in favor of whom? Here you can, it's not the, the quality of the songs. I think these are the relations between the different peoples uh, of Europe here coming out. So my proposal is for a very long time, let's skip the songs and let's only make the voting uh, because out of this we can learn a lot. That's only a nasty joke. Uh, I think uh, what I want to say is we need this relation in the way of the medias uh, to, to know the other, to come together, to discuss the variety to come to a unity. Because one of the preconditions for every unity is we have to know the position of the other. That's of extreme importance. We have one driving force for more unity. That's not politics. It is economy. What you can see, and that's one of the tremendous changes uh, by the enlargement of the European Union, uh, that even for smaller countries, uh, some companies came out as global player. I think, for example, your company, Gorenje, is in uh, Arab countries uh, present and so on and so on. Some Austrian companies, which I never believed, became regional players. OMV uh, going on to Turkey and so on and so on uh, in the oil and gas business. I think some banks became uh, here regional players. I think as I grew up, these banks like uh, Raiffeisen or Erste Savings Bank, I think they were small entities without any importance uh, seen globally. I think here you can see uh, under which changes we are really uh, living. So far, I may say, using uh, your title, out of the box, Europe does not end if we are all, wherever we are, are at the universities concerning science in the business uh, concerning the, the global markets and the European markets, in politics concerning the multilateral relations and the decision making. If we are here going out of the box, then it will be for sure better. I'm asking for your understanding. I was not speaking about European institutions. This is not the first question, it's the second question. I think what was done wrong, for sure, was not the enlargement. That's not the problem. I will give you a short, as short as possible the improvement of this. I think there was Paul Krugman, uh, an American Nobel Prize winner on economy, said, okay, now by the banking crisis, uh, Eastern Europe will fall down. And the banks involved here, especially the Austrian banks, he said, they will be bankrupt. What is the reality? Southern Europe went down, not Eastern Europe. I think these countries have state debts 
which are tremendously smaller than the Western more developed economies uh, like France or England or Germany uh, here. So far, I think it is a complete other situation. I will never forget a, a former governor of the Serbian National Bank. We had a discussion about that the companies shall stay in Southeast Europe, uh, or the Eastern countries uh, for sure. Uh, he, he said a very nice sentence. You're always speaking that everybody will fall down on the earth, you know, your economy. He said, you should not forget, we, the former Eastern country, uh, we were not so high up. If we are falling down, we are closer to the earth than you in the West, which is the reality also. I think out of bad arguments, I'm giving you positive uh, perspectives, but that's for sure right. And so far, personally, I'm convinced, yes, Europe can end also. But what will happen to the parts of Europe? I think I'm always saying a little bit crazy, okay, then England will be the 51st state of the United States, uh, and the French will try to come together with the Algerians and Morocco, uh, and uh, the Italians will try to do something uh, in the Mediterranean area, and the Austrians will look uh, for a system like the Habsburg monarchy without Habsburgs, or something that, that won't work. So far, it's extremely easier to do this common uh, Europe with all the difficulties. We have achieved something, and it's depending on us to develop. I have overused my time. Thank you very much, and I'm available for question and answer.